It's a great pleasure for me to uh, open this uh, third and final stage of the CF. Uh, my name is Nikki Lefebvre. I'm uh, currently Dean of the Faculty of Political and Social Sciences. Uh, I'm also a sociologist and a member of the European Sociological Association, I have to say. Uh, and so extremely happy to have you uh, with us today. And I will just uh, do a very brief presentation of the faculty. Uh, and say a few words about the research that we've been carrying out and we carry out um, on education and training. So the Faculty of Social and Political Science is actually made up of four institutes, the Institute of Sports Studies, the Institute of Psychology, the Institute of Social Sciences, and the Institute of Political Science. And in most of those institutes are actually interdisciplinary in some way. Uh, and then, of course, they come together and, and offer even, uh, an even broader interdisciplinary perspective. So our students have the opportunity either to follow uh, bachelor and master's courses in their disciplinary fields. Usually, they have the option of uh, choosing quite complex uh, bachelor programs and uh, taking courses offered by other institutes. We. Um, are a relatively big faculty in, uh, by Swiss standards. We have about 4,000 students and 500 collaborators. That includes about 320 PhD students and postdocs. So we have uh, quite a, a big research capacity. And uh, we offer, I, I think, a, a very uh, stimulating research and, and teaching environment. Our, um, main objective is to produce research that is innovative, that is both disciplinary and interdisciplinary, and to focus on the complex challenges of contemporary society, so in a very broad spectrum. We pride ourselves on using a, a broad range of methods, both in applied research and in basic research. Uh, we have endless debates, of course, between different paradigms and different research methods, between the quantis and the qualies, who sometimes meet and sometimes don't, who sometimes share the same language and who sometimes don't. And the aim of uh, the research we carry out in the faculty is to make a change, make a change on the national, local, and international uh, scale. We are lucky enough to have benefited from uh, significant support from the Swiss National Science Foundation over the last 12 years. This is a phase of our life, faculty life, that's coming to a close now. But we have had uh, a lot of funding from the FNS uh, to uh, contribute to founding a new interdisciplinary research center, which is now will be a permanent feature of the University of Lausanne, the live center, which focuses on life course research and vulnerability. So vulnerability understood in the, in the term of, sort of social inequality in the broad sense of the word. And the Live Center has been a, a, a very vibrant hub for a lot of members of the faculty. We've been able to finance a lot of PhD uh, studies and a lot of postdocs using mostly uh, um, a life course perspective, which of course is, is uh, used together with influences from, no discipline, from our disciplinary fields and also of course from transdisciplinary fields like gender studies or education studies. The idea here, uh, once again, is to draw on these disciplinary backgrounds and to enrich them with, with uh, insights from other disciplinaries and to contribute to uh, policy making and also to advancing science. We also are lucky enough to host uh, what is, uh, in fact, a national center for, uh, called Expertise in the Social Sciences. This is actually a, a center that manages uh, a whole range of large-scale quantitative um, databases. So the European Social Survey and other such surveys are, are hosted by FORCE, which is actually located within one of our faculty buildings, and where we have a certain number of colleagues who uh, help researchers from right across Switzerland to access this data, to exploit the, the databases, to enrich them with modules that are inspired by their own research. And this is really a fantastic resource for, for the faculty. Uh, FORCE is also involved in a whole lot of uh, very innovative data management, data, data storage, open access uh, policies. Uh, and we, we're really very grateful to have them uh, on hand because they, they provide us with a lot of expertise 
and make sure that we're really following the, the most up-to-date uh, research protocols. And one of our very dynamic interdisciplinary research centers is the OBSEF, so the OBSEF, which stands for Observatoire de l'Education et Formation. This is uh, one of our uh, trans institute uh, dis interdisciplinary research, research centers, which draws on knowledge and research carried out in our four institutes, also in fact in some of the other faculties of the university. Uh, the OBSEF, uh, has a series of, organizes a, a series of uh, research seminars, also organizes conferences like uh, the, the one here, uh, has a, a series of PhD students so that there, there are working papers that are published and there are uh, especially collaborations with other institutes across Switzerland and mostly in the Romandie region who are involved in um, research on education and training. And this follows a very broad spectrum. So this is really come from kind of teacher training to uh, didactics, to education policy, to the psychology of uh, learning, to the sociology of uh, I don't know, educational stratification and so on and so forth. So we have really a very broad range of topics. And the fact that we have this center that is uh, really at the, 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 the hub of uh, our institutional set up with collaboration obviously with the teacher training um, university in Lausanne but also with our education authorities and with policymakers is really absolutely fantastic and one of the reasons why of course this CF is taking place in Lausanne because we have such uh, great resources to be able to welcome you all here. And I take this opportunity to announce that we actually have a position that is advertised at the moment. We are advertising for a professor in the sociology of education. Uh, the call is open until the 9th of November. Uh, so if you're interested in coming to wonderful Lausanne and continuing the great work that's been done, uh, take a look at the uh, job advert, which is uh, on, our, on our website. Uh, the event that we uh, you are attending now is actually the, the final leg the almost final leg, right, of, a, of an academic marathon. Uh, there have already been two events this week, right, it taking place usually uh, in French. So the, the, the Swiss uh, Society for Research on Education kicked off the, the week with a, a doctoral school and with other events. And then we had the International Congress of uh, Actualité de la Recherche en Education and Formation, the AREF, and now we're moving on to the European Sociological Associ Association Research Network 10, uh, part of this massive, uh, this massive CF, which is so ambitious that really, um, yeah, it's, it's incredible. And so I really wanted to thank everyone that's been involved in organizing this whole event, uh, the, the, the whole of the week. I see people still looking relatively good, I mean not exhausted, not absolutely exhausted anyway, and I'm sure that uh, the gala event tonight will enable us all to have fun, to dance, and uh, to uh, build up our energy for the final, the final stage of the event uh, tomorrow. So I really wanted to say obviously thank you to the the pillars of this uh, whole CF that you see here, but also, of course, to all the people who have contributed to making this such a, a success, uh, particularly to the members of the, the, the faculty, be they student assistants or technical staff or our admin staff who are really great and have put in a great effort to make this uh, such a wonderful event. So thank you for being here. Thank you to them for imagining such a, such a great event. And I hand over now to uh, Professor Farina Svesa, who will present our keynote speaker. Thank you, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. She has very tall in me. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Nikki. Uh, I really appreciate your word and the help the faculty gave us to organize this meeting. I will obviously thank everybody for the support, the administrative staff, the colleague, and uh, everybody. But I'm here to introduce Agnes van Zanten, and uh, I would like to say that I'm extremely happy and proud to welcome her 
today for the last keynote of the RF and the first one of RN10 of the ESA. Presenting Agnes von Zanten is very difficult, a real difficult task. She's so famous as a sociologist of education that it's very difficult to isolate one or another team in a work. As everybody knows, Agnes von Zanten had published an uncountable numbers of books and articles that we all use as references in our teaching and in our research. She is nowadays Senior Research Professor, Exceptional Class, at the National Center for Scientific Research. And she describes her era of research as sociology of education and higher education. Sorry, Agnes, I had to shorten it. And uh, elite education, widening, I mix my pages, uh, widening pa participation in higher education and educational policy and international comparison. Among other distinction in the world, Agnes van Zanten received three doctorates honoris causa. She was also appointed as Chevalier de l'Ordre de la Légion d'Honneur de France. And, and she was awarded the CNRS Silver Medal for Talented Experience Researchers. Presently, she is directing the research group Policies and Local Dynamics in Education at Sciences Po. Her present research project focuses on higher education and regional education policies. Regarding her publication, I had difficulty to choose which one I will mention. So after hesitating a lot, my choice was on the sixth, sixth, I repeat, edition of the Sociologie de l'école that she coordinated with Marie de Rubella and Geraldine Farge. This book is indeed the reference everybody uses all around the world, as well as everybody referred to les politiques d'éducation in the French-speaking world. But her interest and expertise are also going to the construction of elite and to practice of family in the educational field. As you can see, the field Agnès van Zanten is covering are huge, and today she will give us a talk on, the equali on equality and inclusion. Thank you very much, Agnès, to present at such a conference that will be a kind of summary of the four days we already went through. Discussing all of this issue as you are going to talk about equality and inclusion. And the floor is yours, Agnes, for your conference on top-down and bottom-up narrative of equality and inclusion in education, the example of policy of widening participation in higher education. I told you the field are huge and numerous. <laughs> and yes, please. Thank you. <laughs> well, hello, after all these compliments, I'm not sure that I'm not going to be paralyzed uh, and not being able to talk. Uh, thank you very much for the ESA uh, uh, Network 10 uh, invitation, especially my colleague Aina Tarabini. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here and also to talk to other colleagues from other um, associ educational associations and, and networks. And uh, I chose to present uh, a, an ongoing work. It has been ongoing for a long time, but is still ongoing, which is on widening participation schemes in France. Uh, it is a very small object in, in one respect, uh, but uh, my, the focus of my presentation is trying to show that it's a big object as well, because it has important consequences, at least I hope I can convince you of that after my presentation. 
So the main research questions I'm going to address is what are the social consequences? I do prefer the word consequences rather than impact, and this means the long range consequences uh, of these um, widening participation schemes, which started to be implemented in the French context in 2001, so uh, 20 years ago, and what are their consequences on equality ideals and the definition of what are the problems, the targets, and solutions around inequalities of access to higher education, but also more generally on education-based social mobility? What are their impact on power relations within the field of higher education and secondary education and interactions between the two fields? What are their impact on the status and roles of education and professionals? And finally, what are their uh, impact, uh, long range impact on policy networks and the role of the state in education? As you can see, these are very big questions. And of course, I'm just going to propose some interpretations that can be discussed. And the work is still ongoing, and these policies are still changing. So there is still a room, uh, I think, for a lot of debate on them. So in fact, widening participation is a small policy in the number of uh, schools and higher education institutions which are concerned, although they have been growing uh, all these uh, years. But it has become a multi-level, multi-purpose, evolving um, policy with a wide variety of schemes. So it gives a it's an interesting object to analyze uh, by a sociologist because of that, but also quite a complex object because it keeps changing and is very different from one place to the other. Also because most of these policies that I will show have started, started to be developed by very prestigious institutions which follow very closely everything that is said about their institution, which doesn't make the work of researchers easier. Uh, so, uh, just very briefly, for those of you who are not familiar with the widening participation schemes more generally, so in the literature there is frequently a distinction between three types of action. Direct affirmative action, which uh, sometimes is called preferential treatment, positive discrimination. In this case, we are referring to quotas, targets, or changes in admission procedures that are granting an advantage to specifically design ethnic, social, or gender groups. Indirect affirmative action, uh, which is perhaps less known uh, in, uh, as a popular term, uh, uh, designates those policies and devices that are used because they uh, are uh, deemed more neutral and socially acceptable criteria. That has been going on in France, but also uh, in many states in the United States after the abolishment by many courts in many different states of uh, direct affirmative action. And this means uh, using other kind of proxy uh, just to target the same groups and especially choosing schools rather than students, not to designate individuals. And outreach policies are a, still a different type, and I put it in italics because I'm going to focus most, mostly on outreach policies, which are policies which are aiming at enlarging the pool of applicants. So nothing changes in terms of admission procedures. It's just different actions that are taken, can be just giving information, tutoring, etc., that is given frequently in secondary schools or to young people uh, who are uh, aiming to uh, attend higher education, and um, enlarging the pool of applicants from these disadvantaged groups. So I'm going to focus more on these policies. So these policies are interesting to observe also from a, a, a policy perspective because they, they represent a good example of this kind of organizational policy cycle. So as I will show very briefly because it's not the heart of my presentation, first you have a kind of intra-institutional change, one institution that made a very disruptive change. Then other institutions started to imitate it or to develop other policies to compete with that institution. And then, as frequently happens in France today, the state intervened and declared that it was a national policy. 
So it's a kind of policy that is in a labeling process. And then when the state does that, then starts again a cycle of institutional change, etc. So it's uh, interesting from that perspective. I will not go into detail into this scheme because I'm not sure that all of you are so interested in that uh, specificity of the French case. Just to show that at the beginning in 2001, there, there was this disruptive policy by my institution where I work at Sciences Po, which launched this policy which is called Convention Education Prioritaire. It generated a lot of debate this debate was organized by Sciences Po itself because there was a very large media campaign, but also because it generated a strong reaction. So there was a strong process of publicization and polarization. Then competing alternatives started to emerge. Uh, and then the state came uh, with this coercive isomorphism with a policy which is called Corde de la Réussite, and I have translated that in English as team for success. It doesn't entirely describe the metaphor in France, in French, sorry, the metaphor in French is uh, an, um, people who climb mountains. So it is the one who is climbing at the top is getting everyone else to the top. So you have these prestigious institutions at the top and are getting the whole educational system is moving up thanks to the help of this institution. So the metaphor is a little bit more powerful in, in French than it is in English, but uh, I did not find any better translation. So I'm not going to dwell on this because this is perhaps not the most interesting part for you. Uh, so one important thing is how this policy, and this is generally the case of policies that last over several years is that they keep sometimes the same name of the policy, but the, the, the sense of the policy, what the policy aims, change. So at the beginning, widening access, the, the aim of the policy was very clearly uh, widening access to prestigious selective higher education strands and institutions, which is clearly an outreach policy, the classic type of outreach policy. Then. When the state came in, in 2008, uh, it declared that all other types of institutions, not only prestigious institutions, should use it. And it was unclear when you read the official text what were the aims of the policy. There were many aims, and one aim that was clearly stated that was that other institutions could use the policy to increase their attractiveness. So it also became like a marketing policy for some institutions. And then at the third level of the policy, there was again uh, a set of official texts that were published in 2020. In fact, the state is clearly stating that this, is the, this, this widening access uh, policy is going to be the policy of transition to higher education. So this has become a kind of national policy of transition to higher education, which in fact, as you are going to see, is delegated to a small number of actors, but is presented as a national policy for access to higher education to everyone. So I'm not going to explain the higher education system to you because it will take very, very long because I think it's probably the most complex higher education system in the world because France has managed to create a huge variety of higher education institutions. So on the left side, you have the university sector. So you have on the one side those specific um, fields uh, which have specific programs, medicine, pharmacy, dentistry. Uh, then you have the typical uh, university system where you have bachelor's degree, master's degree, PhD. Uh, then you have a sector which is short vocational tracks. And I'm going to, inter to uh, focus only on those uh, sectors which are in violet and purple, which are the prestigious sectors, which are the classe préparatoire or grandes écoles, which are two-year classes after the baccalaureate. And then you present the competitive exams to access the grandes écoles. And then you have some grandes écoles and some uh, establishments that are called grands établissements, uh, which uh, you enter directly from the baccalaureate, but 
some of which are quite prestigious as well. So I'm going to focus on that sector mostly, although, as I said, that for the state now, the team for success is, a, is an uh, overall policy that should cover all types of schools. So um, now I'm going to present very briefly the research. In fact, instead of a research, it's a, several pieces of research that I have been conducted. So it started long time ago uh, with an European project in which I developed a small project within that project, which was called the role of knowledge in the elaboration and instrumentation of policies of widening participation in higher education in elite institutions in France. Then, since 2012, I have been conducted a very uh, long-range study of the uh, Sciences Po policy of Convention Education Prédère, and I hope to be able this year to write a book about it. And then Sciences Po asked me to um, explore, to analyze their a new scheme, which is called Premier Campus, that I'm going to talk about. And uh, starting uh, two years ago, I started a new research on this new Team for Success uh, schemes, and I'm still doing that with two qualitative uh, ongoing projects. So I'm just focusing more on that last research, although I will refer to the previous one. So it is based, uh, the two qualitative studies were one study that I conducted with my students in which we analyzed all the websites of all the widening participation schemes in the Ile-de-France region, which is a huge region where Paris is located and represents a quarter of higher education in France, so it's very important. Um, then we did an ongoing ethnographic research on eight schemes using, again, website data, but doing a lot of interviews with the persons in charge of the scheme and doing observations of meetings, sessions, and ceremonies. And now, just starting now, uh, uh, this month, I have a new study on the regulation of these schemes by regional educational authorities. So, I'm going to focus on three schemes. I'm not going to give you a lot of details on the institutions themselves, the, but just uh, some uh, elements. So the first institution is called ESSEC. It is a prestigious, very prestigious uh, management school, training managers, uh, which emphasizes a lot the values of humanism, responsibility, and entrepreneurialism. It started as a Catholic uh, grand école, uh, so it has kept some Catholic values. Uh, then there is Sciences Po, as I said, which is a prestigious higher education institution training leaders for the private and the public sectors and emphasizing innovation and a mix of public and private values. Then an engineering school, which is a, a merger of two engineering schools, which is called Central Supelec, and um, is also promotes the creation of entrepreneurial engineers. And I'm going to focus on three uh, widening participation schemes. One, which is called uh, Une Grande École Pourquoi Pas Moi, and uh, the abbreviation is PQPM, uh, by ESSEC. Then Sciences Po Premier Campus, and then Central Supelec, it has three widening participation schemes, but they are managed by an association which is called OZER, which is Ouverture Sociale pour l'Egalité et la Réussite. So, the first thing I'm going to focus on is on the selection of beneficiaries. So, who uh, are the students who are selected to benefit from widening participation. This is very important because this really has requalified really who deserves uh, this kind of policy and it has made a difference between deserving and undeserving students. And there are a lot of expressions. Some of them I found very shocking. One of the most shocking for me is Pépite de bon lieu which means it's kind of golden thing. And this was a teacher that we interviewed. She says, we take the little pearl of each class. So it's a very uh, symbolic, but it's very practical as well in its consequences. So this is a, a wide uh, presentation here. So perhaps I, I cannot go into all the details of the three schemes. So 
The problem of these schemes is that they have to combine disadvantaged criteria to show that they are really focusing on disadvantaged students. One of the problems, for instance, of the Sciences Po Convention d'Education Prioritaire, that I'm not going to talk about, is that most that half of the beneficiaries are not from very disadvantaged backgrounds. Uh, part of the problem has to do with the targeting of lycées, because fortunately in France, even disadvantaged lycées are not total ghettos. And so even in disadvantaged lycées, if you do not make a, a next level of selection in the lycée, you can get students who are upper class uh, in a disadvantaged lycée. So that's part of the problem, but that's not the only problem, is how do you define disadvantage uh, so that the students are disadvantaged, but not too disadvantaged, because if they are too disadvantaged, then your policy is not going to be very successful, at least not immediately, and not in spectacular terms, and is generally sought uh, by these institutions. So how do you define disadvantage? And also, if you make differences across students, what kind of meritocratic criteria you use? And if you are too meritocratic, then you can be accused of being too selective. You are just focusing on the very, very best students. So what do you do? And that's not very simple. Uh, the ESSEC has evolved over time. The ESSEC is the um, longest lasting outreach policy. It started in 2002. It is a management school that has invested a lot in this policy, which is for them a very important management program that shows all their capacity in management. So it's a very sophisticated program and it has really evolved over time. So it's in a sense the most interesting one to observe. So in their case, they use a lot of indicators of disadvantage. So uh, of course, students' uh, socioeconomic status, parents' education, uh, whether they are single families, uh, students with scholarships, but also they do a qualitative assessment of what they call level of need. And they have interviews, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute, where they try to assess how needy is the student? And needy can mean a lot of things. Whether the student goes to museums with the parents, whether the parents are interested in higher education. So it gives them a lot of leeway about what is disadvantage. At the same time, the focus is to avoid the students that are truly disadvantaged. So this is something that I, I took from one of the forms that they send to the schools. It is important to verify that the candidates do not have social, family, or personal problems that are too heavy for them to be involved. So the idea, as happens with many programs, is that you take people who can profit from the program. And when you do that, then you leave away a lot of people who are really needy, and you create a class of deserving people for the program. And then, for meritocratic criteria, they also have a quite sophisticated system where they have developed a thing which is called proven academic potential. So that means that it's not academic results only, because if they were taking students with very, very good academic results, well, they will not find many, many students and they will be accused of just taking the best, best student. So this is this indicator of proven academic potential and so the concept of potential becomes very important. How do you assess potential rather than results? It's easy to assess results if you refer to grades, etc., exam, but how do you assess potential? Uh, discipline, so regular attendance, uh, lack of discipline problems, and also motivation, curiosity, sense of effort, hard work, desire to succeed. The Central Cipelec is a more recent uh, uh, widening participation scheme, one of the widening participation schemes, one of the three they have, has been copied, imitates the PQPM, and it's called PQPM, that they have imported into their institution. So they are not as sophisticated, but they use similar criteria. They are not as sophisticated. The Sciences Po program was a little different because Sciences Po wanted to emphasize more on giving a lot of uh, um, academic training to the students, and they wanted to have students who were not really, who were average students. 
But the problem is that when you go to the detail of how each lycée in the program interpret the term average, you see that in the end, the profile of the student is quite varied because you can put a lot of things into what is an average student. And again, the students have to be motivated, uh, do not have any kind of discipline problems, etc. So, how do they go about the selection? The ESSEC is a very, and we were happy that they were very generous in providing all the information, which was not the case necessarily in all the institutions that we studied. Uh, so the ESSEC, we have a lot, a lot of information of them. So we have forms that describe exactly the process that has to be followed in each school. So first, teachers are informed about the ESSEC selection criteria and asked to pre-select two to six students on the class on the basis of proven school potential and motivation. Then the teachers and the head teachers meet to pre-select one to four students on the base of this advantage and this uh, academic criteria. Then the pre-selected students and parents are informed and those students who are voluntary to participate must fill an application form and send a statement letter uh, to be taken. And then at the fourth level, there is a local jury with a, an ESSEC member and one teacher to interview students to assess motivation and level of need. So there is all this huge process just to select students to the program. It, it, it looks almost like a selection for a competitive exam to access to the Gans Ecole. The others were not so sophisticated, but again, there was a process of a combination of teacher advice, head teacher advice, and also self-selection by the students based on objective criteria, but also on some gut feeling because many of these people are using some managerial criteria and say, well, per perhaps this person doesn't show to have, to have good grades, but I have the feeling that this person has a lot of potential. So it's also very qualitative and in a sense, very arbitrary of who gets to be selected. So now I come to what's the diagnosis and the treatment of these students. So what's the problem and what is the solution? And as political uh, scientists have uh, shown us for a long time, many times what happens in policy is that you have the treatment and then you invent the problem. And this was the case uh, here, as in many policies, is that you know what should be done and then you find people with the problem that uh, uh, is going to be solved. So, in fact, uh, a common leitmotiv was, in a sense, uh, invented by the ESSEC and popularized a lot, which was the idea of self-censorship, of autocensure. So that became a keyword. The big problem about access to higher education is self-censorship. This is, of course, a very a common uh, um, uh, and a very consensual term because it only focuses on the students. It doesn't blame uh, directly the families. It doesn't blame the schools. Of course, it doesn't blame the higher education institutions. It doesn't blame the state. So, of course, it can be very consensual and it has become extremely popular. So all the official texts now about access to higher education, the big problem is what do we do about self-censorship. And one of the things that is problematic for researchers is that Bourdieu has used a lot uh, at the beginning by ESSEC to showing that many of the writings were about this self-censorship. And of course, there is one way of you can interpret some of the writings about faire des nécessités vertu and some of the things that you can find uh, in some of the text. And, but it has a different focus according to the institution. At the ESSEC, it has a very strong, strong sorry, psychological focus on this self-censorship. So on the one hand, they talk about lack of information, but the focus is really on lack of confidence and students feeling illegitimate in higher education. So that, that's really the problem. And also the problem, and the state has also uh, taking this problem is that students don't know themselves well. So the idea is that if they knew themselves well, they increased their self-confidence, they became more legitimate, the problem about access to higher education will be solved. In the case of um, 
Sciences Po, it was a little bit more realistic in this premier campus because there was also a focus on the lack of mastery of the cognitive competences necessary to succeed in higher education. And in the case of the engineering school, there was also that because they are in engineering school and focusing on students who have a scientific background, they also focus a lot on the fact that students, the problem of this self-censorship is that many students have fear of hard sciences. So the idea is that we have to convince them about hard sciences are not so hard. Uh, so uh, this has been become very popular as a term. And so uh, defining the problem in this way has legitimated the intervention of these institutions and it has uh, provided the solution for this. So ESSEC has a very sophisticated program that has evolved over time. Um, the idea is develop all these entrepreneurial selves through regular intensive tutoring. There are a lot of specialized workshops about uh, oral skills, um, corporal expression, and also a lot of visits to firms and cultural sites. Uh, Sciences Po, um, in, in the Premier Campus, it focused more on cognitive high order and what is called, that's also a key term, is that students have methodological problems. And when you're talking about the kind of difficulties they find in higher education, they say, no, they just need the methodology to succeed in higher education. As if it was a set of recipes that you could learn the methodology and succeed in higher education. There is always in France, and I will come back in my conclusion to this, this idea that these students are lacking what is called in France, that's a very important concept, general culture. So if they don't have enough general culture, so they need to have that. And there is also always a, a, lot, a lot of mistrust that they are not truly citizens, especially if they are from an immigrant background. So they also need a kind of re, being re-citizenized by these policies. Um, and so they, they, most of these schemes do similar things. They do tutoring. Some of the tutoring can be quite sophisticated like the ESSEC. The students have tutoring every week, three hours. So it's very systematic. In other places, it's less systematic, less ambitious. Uh, they have these summer camps. They have these visits to firms. They visit to cultural sites, uh, trips abroad or trips around France, etc. So that's the kind of general widening participation program, which is not different from what, for instance, I have been doing some comparisons uh, with the widening participation schemes in England. And in fact, they are relatively similar. If you look at the widening participation schemes of Cambridge, Oxford, etc., they, they look very similar to a large extent. So, as I said in my first questions, I wanted also to focus on what is the impact on the emergence of new roles, new actors, new channels. Uh, so one thing is the emergence of the student tutor. So the development of these policies have gone uh, together with the development of a major figure today, which is the student tutor. And the student tutor is a very useful figure, uh, first because of the kind of policies that are developed. So providing insider information on higher education provision, because as you remember, students don't have enough information about application strategies, higher education trajectories acting as role models because the students feel illegitimate, because they don't have self-confidence, etc. They need role models uh, for this potentially socially and academically mobile student. Also, the activities they offer are more fun. They are more like young people activities, more informal advice. They are closer to students, etc. And also, and last but not least, they are much cheaper because they are seldom paid. So you have a workforce uh, which is seldom paid because it's rewarded by different forms of recognitions in their degrees, etc., um, depending on the schools or their engagement is rewarded in different ways. So these student tutors are left with quite a lot of autonomy. At ESSEC, they have a script uh, where they have to follow, which is developed every week 
by the SX service in charge of that. But in many other widening participation tutors, it's just the tutors are very free to improvise and do what they think is best to help the students. Uh, and one of, of course, of the big question is that there is almost no coordination with teachers. Most of the teachers we have interviewed, they don't know at all what's going on in these tutoring activities. So for instance, one teacher we interviewed in the SEC program, she said, we're not supposed to do anything as the SEC does everything. And she said, well, I don't know anything that is going on, only that there are these activities and that my students go there uh, every week, etc." So the teachers are there, especially, for instance, in the Sciences Po program, the teachers were there because they hire secondary um, school teachers with um, high qualifications to be part of the program. But they were there alongside university professors that were intervening in the programs. And also, and this has also become a key figure, is that professional working in private firms so more and more they intervene in these programs as specialists in their area, just to present the different uh, work areas to students, uh, but also as counselors in recruitment uh, into jobs, especially, of course, uh, high-level jobs. And in a sense, there has been a displacement where in many places it is like a, 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 an equation has been created between being recruited to a job and being recruited to university. And one of the things that is happening is that in the new online system in France that we have, which is called Parcoursup, that you have to use to apply to higher education, now the system uh, asks students to write uh, a short statement letter uh, saying why they want to follow that course. And in fact, because they get all this advice by recruiter, they spend hours and hours in the leases, in the disadvantaged leases, preparing these statement letters. Most of the higher education fields they apply to, they don't read the statement letters because they have so many students applying that they don't take into consideration these letters. But the students are convinced that job recruitment, and they also uh, work a lot the oral skills. How do you present yourself? But when you are recruited in higher education in France, you don't have interviews, except in some of the grands écoles later on. But they prepare for interviews, etc., as if they were already preparing for a job. And in fact, it's what they are doing in a sense, because the firms are preparing them for the job, but they have managed to convince the whole system that preparing for a job is the same thing as preparing for university. So another thing that has changed is all this channeling between secondary schools and higher education institutions. Of course, most of the prestigious higher education institutions, especially Sciences Po, which has a large um, number of lycées, which are partners of Sciences Po, which are now, uh, next year, there should be 200, which is quite big. Um, but even schools that have only set leases, they are very proud to say that they have these partnerships with the disadvantaged leases. It is very important for them because in their figures, they frequently say, well, in fact, our policies uh, in, in the program, you can have 15 students that are benefiting from a widening participation program, but they say, we are concerned with 15 uh, leases, and you take all the population in the leases as being concerned by the policy. So you have a kind of mathematical growth of the policy, and of course, it's very important that they um, show that they have these partnerships with, um, that become pipelines to go to them. The problem is that in many cases they are not pipelines to get into these higher education institutions because remember these are outreach programs so they are not promising the students that they will get to the higher education institution and in fact the number of students for instance who have entered ESSEC after following this program is extremely small. I think it's around uh, 20 students, something like that. It's extremely small. So it's not at all a pipeline to get to that higher education institution, but it's presented uh, as that. But at the same time, what is happening is that this uh, widening participation schemes, now that the state has decided that 
every higher education institution should have a widening participation scheme is that, in fact, they are used by institutions that don't have enough students to attract new students, so to create new pipelines. And they are also used, especially, for students in the professional tracks, which are a big problem for the government because they don't want them uh, to follow other kinds of higher education studies that the short vocational tracks, but in fact, because they have the baccalaureate, they can go to other types of tracks. So they are used to create new, strongest pipeline between short vocational higher education tracks and professional tracks in secondary schools. So they have many uses. As I said, they are multi-purposes and they serve many things. They also are created a lot of new relationships between secondary school and firms because many firms that are intervening in the programs now have created partnerships with the schools and they regularly go for visits and conference, they offer mentorship, they offer guidance for applying to jobs and higher education. So this has created a whole new um, form of channels uh, in the education system and between the education system and the work sector. And finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about the policy networks and state control. And so, uh, as I said, there is this participation of private firms, not only to some of the widening participation schemes, activities in the schools, but more generally. So, in fact, in France, we don't use the term public-private partnerships in education. So this has not become a keyword. In, in France, it's very difficult to talk about private intervention in education so openly, although it becomes more and more open every day. Uh, but in fact, the, these are public-private partnerships as they exist in other countries because these private firms are contributed to the funding of the schemes. They also participate in some cases to the conception of the schemes and the activities in terms of guidance. And now some of the schemes, for instance, ESSEC, are using private firms to evaluate their schemes. So, the, the, in fact, these, these are a very um, strong types of partnership but that are not presented as such. And so, what's the role of the state in all this? Uh, the state has, as very late, because the first schemes started in 2001, it was only in 2008 that the state decided to launch this policy or team for success. And so there was a charter that was created for the schemes and instructions and circulars. But in fact, there has almost been no evaluation of the schemes. There has only been a single report by the inspectors, which by the way was surprisingly uh, quite critical, which is not usual in inspectors' reports, because the end conclusion of the report is, without being exhaustive, this study gives an idea of a reality that navigates between convincing successes and ambiguous misguidance, between rigor and confusion in its management. So it was, for an inspectorate report, it was extremely critical. It was followed only in 2022, so quite recently, by two recent surveys, just asking the higher education institutions and the secondary schools involved about what were their opinions about the policy, which unsurprisingly, uh, the, the views are very positive because of course most of the institutions and the schools want to keep the schemes, which receive also uh, state money, of course. And the, there is some involvement of regional uh, political authorities uh, and um, there is an encouragement now by the state for the regional educational authorities to become more involved in the monitoring and evaluation of this regional scheme. But in fact, in France, we know that uh, evaluation is very weak in general and monitoring as well. And in this area, even more than in other areas, especially consider that most of these higher education institutions have a lot of autonomy and they don't depend on the state, so they will not follow close instructions by the state and they will not submit themselves to that kind of state evaluation. So in fact, there is very light state control and in fact, there is a strong delegation from the state to these institutions and to these schemes with very light state control. 
So now just to round up my presentation and come back to my initial question. So what are the general consequences? Well, I have tried to point at them a little bit in, uh, in the presentation, but I'm just to summarize. In terms of equality, so there is a kind of renewed version of the French sponsor mobility model. In my analysis of the French educational system, I have uh, in the last years frequently used this model by uh, American sociologist Ralph Turner, who compares what he calls contest mobility and sponsor mobility. He used those concepts to contrast the um, uh, American system as a contest mobility system and the English system as sponsor mobility. I have write I have written critically about this, showing that this scheme has to be revised, etc. But I still think it's very powerful and that the French system is a system of a sponsor mobility. What uh, Turner means by sponsor mobility is that there is the choice of a small number of people that can move up in the system and that receive a special attention. He used that to show that that was the way the elite was trained in France. But then an um, American researcher coined the terms several years ago uh, of compensatory sponsor mobility. The idea that affirmative action is a kind of compensatory sponsor mobility. What I mean is that these policies are not really opening up the competition in France. What they are doing is just selecting new beneficiaries, a small group of beneficiaries that are going to benefit from these policies and as I have tried to show you, that have specific qualities. They are not identical to the elite because they are not elite, but they have to show that they have some qualities that will help them integrate into the elite and perhaps change it a little bit, but not that much. So it is in a, in a sense what I'm trying to say is that it's a very conservative policy because it talks a lot about opening up new opportunities and it gives new opportunities to a small number of students that can benefit from this. These students have to show a lot of cultural goodwill, acceptance of national value, to show to have potential, motivation, drive, uh, uh, leadership, etc. Uh, but certainly the, the, there is an opening, but it's a very uh, small opening for a selected few. And so it, it less the other students are considered as undeserving students. Uh, so there is a reinforcement of the channeling of other students toward less prestigious tracks. And of course, this increases the responsibility that is given to the students because the teachers, the state, different actors can say, you had an opportunity and you did not take the opportunity. So that's your problem. Uh, and, and so it's a, in, in that sense, it's a very important policy in the kind of uh, consequences it can have uh, for large uh, numbers of students which are not directly concerned, but potentially concerned by the policy. What uh, social consequences on the power relations and on educational professions? So, I have written uh, some articles on how these policies have contributed to the political re-legitimation of the Grandes Écoles. Because we have, of course, the tradition of the French Revolution, elites and elite institutions are at the same time very powerful in France and constantly under criticism. So they have to re-legitimize themselves constantly, although, of course, their position is not really strongly threatened. In fact, these policies have not really changed the relationships in the field of higher education because these policies are not considered as important as policies in internationalization, for instance, of higher education and in other sectors. But still, it has contributed to the re-legitimation of Grands Ecoles in two different ways. On, on the one hand, the Grands Ecoles have become part of the great family of higher education. As I showed you in, in the presentation, you know, this fragmented French higher education, the Grands Ecoles have always been seen as apart 
from higher education. And now they look like we are together. We are all working together, team for success. So we are all together in the same game. So that has symbolically integrated them more strongly into higher education. At the same time that in other policies, they are fighting not to be integrated into higher education in other ways, but that's another story. I cannot go into that. And at the same time, what I think is extremely important is that the Gonce Call have become educational actors. They have become people who have something to say about education and who have what should be done in education, what are the programs that should be implemented, what are the problems that students have. So they have become key educational actors that are dictating part of the policy, at least the policy that concerns access to higher education, but more generally all the policy about what social mobility through education should be about, who deserves to be helped, what kind of help should be given to the students, etc. So this creates a delegitimation of professionals in the educational sector. As I show, the teachers are really do not play a central role in these policies, uh, except perhaps in the premier campus Sciences Po policy. But this, in fact, has been accepted by teachers because in the last years, the state has put a lot of pressure on teachers to do a lot of things on guidance to higher education. Secondary teachers in France, most of them consider that guidance is not part of their job and that other people should take care of guidance, that they don't have any training on guidance, there are not very strong incentives for teachers to do guidance. So many teachers that I have interviewed are very happy to delegate guidance to higher education to other professionals, so to student tutors, but also in other types of research that I have been doing in access to higher education is also delegated for higher education fairs, uh, to uh, information on the internet, etc. So that's part of the process of teachers have been um, delegitimated as guidance counselors in access to higher education. So their people processing role, I, I frequently use this terminology from a researcher called Hassenfeld. So they said the two functions of uh, uh, organizations that take uh, care of people are people processing and people changing. So the people processing role, the guidance and selection has been uh, taken uh, out from them, but also the people changing. Because teachers in France, they have focused so much on the academic side, then the widening participation scheme say, but you don't take care of the personal side of the students. So everything that is like, uh, not necessarily pastoral care, but everything that has to do with motivation, uh, that kind of thing, is taken up by other actors than teachers. So in fact, the teacher's role is being reduced, reduced, to some extent with the complicity of teachers, but to some extent is also because teachers do not feel strong enough about what should be done in, in that sector. So there is this emergence of new actors who have no specific educational skills. The main skill of student tutors is that they are students and that they have been through the system. That's the skill, their person is the skill. And also the firms that are coming, well, the skills are recruiting people for jobs. They don't have particular educational skills, but it's this kind of experiential and embodied familiarity. So it's like you don't need training. You need just to be yourself to help the people. And I think this has profound implication well beyond these widening participation schemes. And the last thing is about the policy networks and the state roles. So, there is this new set of policy actors that are now occupying this new area of transition from secondary to uh, higher education, which is a key transition in our developed societies today because, I mean, the 21st century is the century of massification of higher education as the 20th century was massification of secondary education and 19th century massification of primary education. So it's a key role. And then you have this large network of uh, people who are participating to decisions. Uh, so you have these directors of higher education institutions, a lot of agencies that have uh, emerged, also specializing in this transition, regional political actors, private firms. 
Personally, I, I, I don't want to be too critical in the sense that I think this is a big change and it is, in a sense, understandable that many actors participate to debates about what should be done and how it should be done. The problem is, is that the role of the state is really becoming extremely low. Uh, it, it's very poor because there is a very strong delegation of the conception, monitoring and evaluation of the policy and the role of the state is the labeling of the local teams and their integration into a global discursive frame. In a sense, that has always been the role of the state in France. I'm always fascinated, even if I've been in France now for 40 years, of how important this course is in France uh, for governing, uh, but more generally. Uh, and also, so this course is very important in education, but in this case, it's almost that the discourse is the only way in which the state is intervening and giving the labels uh, to uh, some of the schemes. But even the criteria to give the labels are extremely simple. So it's very few of the higher education institutions that don't get the label for their widening participation policy. Whatever they are doing in the field, which can be extremely varied, I only focus here on three prestigious institutions, but we are also studying institutions which are not prestigious and which are doing other things that I could not present in detail today. So it is extremely heterogeneous in the kind of things that are going on in the field. So these are some of the things I wanted to share today. I hope that it was interesting for you, even if you are not interested in these schemes, and of course, if you are not interested particularly in French policy and what's going on in the French education system. Thank you. Uh, hi, and yes, thank you very much. Um, first, it's really an honor to be able to listen to you live since we have studied a part of your work and quoted it, obviously. Uh, I would be interested to know how, um, what comparisons you are aiming to do. Are you thinking of doing any comparisons with other countries, other French-speaking countries with similar contexts? Or... Um, more UK US based since these widening participation schemes kind of started there as far as I know but I'm not very um, I haven't read a lot about it but it would be interesting to me and also what type of recommendation to policymakers our researchers doing currently in regard of all the issues you pointed out through the schemes and who really actually gets to benefit and is there really a culture change in um, the higher education system? Thank you. Thank you. Should I answer immediately or take several questions? Would you prefer to have or whatever you more prefer. than one question? Okay. Maybe. Hello, Agnes. Yeah, hello. Thank you for your presentation. So I have one question but like the um, the fact you talk about the opening, the opening door of this kind of uh, scheme, but what about of the exit door? Like, when they enter to it, it's more broader, socially open, but what's happened for the outcome? What kind of job do they find those people who've come from low social background? Yeah. I'm interested to know if you got statistic on that. Thank you. So I'll take first the, the first question. Yes, I, I think it's very important to do comparative work and I am um, planning to do so. So I already am quite familiar with some of the schemes, especially in the UK, but I'm planning to go, for instance, uh, uh, in November I will go to Cambridge to examine their scheme, which is called the Foundation Year, where they do, do a year for the students who come from disadvantaged backgrounds. 
And yes, I think in many countries there are now these kinds of, of schemes. So it's very uh, interesting to analyze. I also have a lot of connections in Brazil, and I was there uh, at the end of August, and I got a lot of information. They have a lot of data because they have collected in some of the Brazilian universities, they have collected a lot of data on the different schemes they have. So I'm planning to do that, and, and I think it will be important to, um, to analyze what are the institutions involved, what are the different criteria that are used, because that, that will make for a, an interesting comparison across countries. But I don't have that much to say about the comparison now, because that's something that I plan to do in the future. Concerning the recommendations, in fact, one of the problems of the field, now that there is a huge field of widening participation, it's like they have journals and everything. One of the problems that I have found is that many people who work in this area are people who are uh, in the institution occupying administrative positions and frequently they are focusing only on their own widening participation policy, etc. So it's not a uh, frequently easily to disentangle sometimes what is uh, part of the marketing policy of the institution and what is really research about the scheme uh, in the institution. Uh, uh, in my research, well, I don't focus on giving uh, recommendations to policymakers. I just am frequently invited to discuss with them and I, I, I enjoy doing that and I accept doing that, so I have tried to uh, just attract their attention to what is happening about these schemes, about the fact that they are extremely heterogeneous, what they are changing the view about guidance. Some of the policymakers I have encountered are sensitive to some of the criticism, uh, some are less open to it, but um, I mean, my, my recommendations are, are very general. In fact, I'm not, because I think each scheme is particular and has also, as you can give recommendations to each scheme as well. As concerns the evaluation, the problem is that the, the lack of data about what happens to the students in the schemes. Most of the institutions have not done any evaluation about the schemes because the idea about outreach is that you are just making people sensitive to higher education, just more open to higher education. How, how can you measure that people have become more self-confident, etc.? The only institution that has done some evaluation is the ESSEC, but as I said, most of the problem is that the, the evaluation has been done either by private firms or by researchers from ESSEC, so it's a bit problematic, there is no external, and the government has not uh, developed any kind of uh, scheme to uh, follow up what has happened to these students. Uh, the ESSEC follow the student, and well, even if the evaluations can be criticized, they are still interesting. And in fact, I think that these policies are successful in a very uh, limited sense in the fact that the students that really benefit from intensive tutoring like in the ESSEC policies and from a lot of different uh, activities and actions, they do make more ambitious higher education choices and frequently they succeed a little better in higher education. The problem is, is that there's a tiny number of students that are getting that benefit. And we don't even know if that is the case in programs which are less ambitious than the ESSEC program because if you do tutoring once a month, I'm not sure that is really effective for the students. So we don't have any clear data about that, but I think that it is not, uh, I mean, I will not be surprised that in schemes that are really very well developed and well planned, you do get a small group of students that get much more attention, that get more ambitious choices and uh, more uh, success in, in uh, selective higher education institutions. The problem for me is that it concerns a very, very small number of students. And something that I did not mention is that many teachers that I have known for many years when I was doing work on educational priority areas and all kinds of equality policies, they are convinced this is France equality policy now. <laughs> and I keep telling them, at best, this is a policy that can really renew the elite to some extent, open the doors a little bit to a very selected few group of students. It cannot be a policy that can 
uh, ambitiously reduce inequality because it really, as I said, concerns very, very small number of students. And as I said, just with very specific characteristics, uh, those students that potentially were more likely to profit from the schemes. Thank you very much for this answer. Do we have more questions? Yes, thank you very much, and yes, for this very, very interesting uh, talk, as usual, very clear, very well documented. Um, I was particularly interested in your point on the, the change, the shift of semantics and objectives of the new schemes as they now target transitions, if I understand, between secondary uh, school and university in particular. Um, I understand your analysis is basically quite critical, uh, I think you say that, about the shift, as you mostly underline the legitimization, the individualistic uh, normative focus, the dequalification of uh, teachers, etc., the loss of power of state, uh, etc. On, on the other hand, a res research on schooling inequalities has recently focused on transitions and in particularly on school linking processes between secondary schools and university, for example. So I was wondering, do you think there could be a more emancipatory policy working on transitions between secondary schools and university? Or are you basically critical about it? Or to what conditions could this be uh, interesting to work on transitions and school linking processes? Well, I, uh, as I said uh, very briefly at the end, I, I think that this transition is quite important and in fact is not very well organized yet and is particularly complex in the French case because of the complexity of the higher education system in, in France with all these different tracks and institutions, different prestige and the different uh, lengths of studies, etc. So I, I do think that there is room for the participation of different actors to the construction of the transition from secondary to higher education. The problem, I think, is the way the, the, the problem is framed and then the solutions are framed is that it started as a policy coming from these prestigious higher education institutions. And what they are doing is not something that is convenient for the rest of the uh, system. I mean, it, it will be very useful if different types of higher education institutions could collaborate with secondary schools in managing the transition for different types of schools, etc. Of course, the idea will be that we will reduce all this fragmentation and hierarchization in the French system. But given the system as it is, I think the, the fact is that with this labeling process, the state is just saying, just do as the Grands Ecoles do. And in fact, the universities cannot do exactly the same thing. The short vocational tracks cannot do the same things. So they are just imitating, to some extent, these policies. But I'm not uh, uh, about critical on the fact that they have to participate into the transition process together with the secondary school. It's just that the kind of framing of the problem, framing of the solution, framing of the type of beneficiaries, etc., is contaminating a debate which should be different about what should be done about access to higher education. And of course, uh, as I say, many actors can have a say uh, comprising the regional political authorities, comprising even the private sector perhaps can play a, a, a role if it is regulated in the kind of information or services that it can provide to students. The problem is, in, in a sense, that it has come from the top, uh, not the top of the state, but the top of the higher education, most prestigious institution, getting down and not giving them all the resources and possibilities of what they can do to help the transition. So no, I'm not critical about working on the transition. On the opposite, I think there is a lot to be done on transitioning to higher education now. It's just the, the, the path that France is following doesn't seem to be the good path. Thank you for your conference. I find it very uh, suggestive and interesting. And um, I was wondering when you stress the power of uh, Grande Ecole uh, with this widening 
um, policies. How do universities, public universities, react? Because uh, when we know that um, the best students with a um, working class background uh, usually don't go to grand écoles and go to universities, um, is there a reaction or can we consider that Parcoursup is now uh, the right for universities to, to play the same game but not with the same resources? <laughs> Clearly, the, I, I don't have, a, unfortunately, we, we don't have really all the data to have a, a, a good national landscape uh, about all these widening participation schemes. I can only talk a little bit about the widening participation schemes in the Ile-de-France region because that's the, the study we made. And of course, universities are not so involved as the Grands Ecoles in the schemes, although now they are the majority in the schemes. In the national survey I mentioned that was just published in March 2022, um, the majority of the widening participation schemes, I think they, they represent 40% of the widening participation schemes now, the universities, but what are the university schemes? In fact, you really have to go to the field. Frequently, it's only a partnership with one or two leases, which are close by, uh, where they want to secure perhaps that very good students or good students uh, in these leases come to the university. They use it as a kind of policy for getting a little bit more information on the schools, but they are not particularly ambitious about the tutoring or the other activities, etc. So it's a very kind of light partnership, just securing perhaps that some uh, nearby uh, establishments where they want to attract students come. But we are not, we, well, our study is not finished, so we plan to have more on what these universities are doing, the short vocational tracks are doing, etc. So we were more advanced in these higher education institutions because I had done previous work on that. But in, in the future, I want to say more about what universities and other tracks are doing as well. But we don't have enough information yet. Um, I would have a follow-up to the previous question, and so what about private higher inst institutes in the Paris area and uh, institutions such as Dauphine, which are a university and a grande école, and what, is there an ambivalence, and I mean, I'm, I'm sure you don't have all the answers, but to me these are also interesting questions, because in France we have these weird institutions that are all in once and so it to me it questions also their position as a leader and their responsibility with these programs. Well, Dauphin has a program which is more than outreach programs because they, they change a little bit their admission policy. So in some of the secondary schools where I have been working, the Dauphin scheme is, is at work where they prepare students uh, to, to prepare for the Dauphin exam, so they give extra tutoring for, for the students in, the, in that field. So yes, I think most higher education institutions now, especially the most prestigious one, feel concerned that they need to have a scheme. But it's not all institutions. For instance, at the moment, I'm doing another research on another topic on a, a very prestigious management school, which is called SSCP. And SSCP doesn't have any widening participation scheme. So some private institutions might not feel necessary to have these schemes because part of the, um, the, fa of the reason why the um, most prestigious higher education institutions have these schemes in France is also for state legitimation, etc. So some of the institutions which are truly private, because you know in France we have a complicated system which some of the schools are private but they depend on these chambers of commerce so it's not a, the same private as private, private, etc. So those that are truly private, uh, um, in fact they might not need to have this widening participation scheme. So that's also part of the research, looking at those institutions that for instance can be quite prestigious and do not have the widening participation scheme. So. I talk, uh, we made an interview with the director of SSCP and he said, I don't need any scheme. I'm not at all interested in diversifying uh, the students that I have here. I'm very happy with my students, uh, even if they are 100% upper class. So doesn't, if that's not a problem for me. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you. Is that another question? <laughs> if there are none, uh, we just have to thank you, and yes, very much because for for the very thank you for your invitation. Very interesting kind. conference, and uh, for us, a conference on France, which is quite different <laughs> for the higher education in Switzerland, which is not very easier <laughs> to understand too. Thank you very much, uh, and uh, thank you. Let's